Hello, my name is John Waldron. I'm going to be teaching EAS 421, Structural Geology and Tectonics, in the fall. This will be the first time for teaching it remotely. And I'd like to show you some of the ideas that you're going to meet uh, during the course. Uh, if you did 233 with me this year, you'll recognize the map behind me on the wall. It's uh, sometimes known as the map that changed the world. It was the first geological map that was ever made in England and Wales. Um, just over 200 years ago. Um, and in EAS 233, the focus was very much on maps and on understanding where structures are in the Earth's crust now at the present day. In 421, we're going to be looking at the processes that put the Earth's crust into its present day configuration. The movements of plates, the ways rocks are deformed, um, and the emphasis is going to be on change during the history of the Earth. I'm going to share the screen again and uh, show you a few of the things that we're going to be meeting. Uh, so uh, if I return to my PowerPoint slides here, um, this view is of Mount Gimnuska in southern Alberta. Um, if you get a chance to go to third year field school, we uh, stop here and take a look at the uh, thrust faults, describe their geometry. Uh, you may have seen maps of these structures. Um, in uh, EAS 421, uh, we're going to have a look at how those structures came to be. This is a dynamic model of a thrust belt uh, produced by a colleague of mine, Glenn Stockmull, at the Geological Survey of Canada. And it attempts to show how it's possible for one big mass of rock to be thrust over another uh, during movements of the plates during convergence. We actually work at a great range of scales in EAS 421, uh, starting with the global scale. And this is a slide produced by a program called G-Plates. So here we are in G-Plates, and uh, G-Plates is a neat program. It's available for free, it's uh, in the public domain. Um, and it enables us to, by moving this slider up at the top right hand corner, actually to run Earth history backwards uh, and look at positions of plates in the past. We can edit these to make different models and try different uh, reconstructions of plate movements. Uh, so we can run, here we go all the way back to the early Mesozoic and here you can see Pangaea assembling and in fact you can in this model go back, uh, back into the Paleozoic and see some suggestions as to how Pangaea came together. So I'm going to set that running forwards and you can watch uh, Pangaea assemble and then break apart. And um, this is a neat tool for uh, looking at the history of the Earth and the tectonic system on a global scale. Now, we look at a variety of scales in EAS 421. And uh, one of the things you may be missing is the opportunity to see rocks in the field. Uh, so we will try to uh, relate this large scale to the sorts of things that you would be able to see in the field if we were able to go in the field. So I'm going to show you a short video that we made in Western Newfoundland uh, on a piece of ancient oceanic lithosphere, a piece of a, a ocean, ocean floor that has been thrust up onto the continent uh, during the Paleozoic era, actually during the building of Tangier, and have a look at some of the features uh, that we can see there. This outcrop represents a really important boundary within the Earth. Uh, this boundary was identified by geophysicists many decades ago, um, typically at a depth between 5 kilometers under the oceans and 40 to 70 kilometers, 30 to 70 kilometers under the continents. And it's a boundary where the velocity of seismic waves increases quite suddenly from less than 7 kilometers a second to over 8 kilometers a second. And that boundary was discovered by a geophysicist called Mohorovicic, but because the name is so difficult to pronounce, uh, it's commonly abbreviated to the MOHO. Now, for many years, the MOHO was kind of a theoretical concept. Nobody had ever seen it. Uh, it was known to be uh, the base of the crust. In fact, it was defined as forming the base of the crust. Um, but there are a few places in the world where slabs of oceanic lithosphere have been thrust up onto the continent. Those places or those rock suites are known as ophiolites. And sometimes, they preserve within them the moho, the boundary between the crust and the mantle. So this is one such place. This is the Tablelands in Grosmont National Park in western Newfoundland. 
um, I'm standing actually on the boundary between this grey rock here, which is a gabbro. Uh, it has lots of feldspar in it, which is weathering white on the surface. Um, and the rusty coloured rock underneath me uh, is peridotite. It has no feldspar, it's made of olivine and pyroxene. And it happens that typical seismic velocities in gabbros will be less than 7 kilometers a second. Typical velocities in pure peridotites are over 8 kilometers a second. And so we think that this zone here that I'm standing in preserves the moho. So as you look to the west here, you can see that the landscape is mostly gray gabbro. And as you look to the east, you can see that the hills are mostly orange weathering through the tide. In between there is a zone maybe a hundred meters or two wide uh, where the two rock types alternate. I'm just standing on one of those boundaries. And so the Moho is actually a zone that's maybe a couple of hundred meters wide. And this is true of the Moho when we sense it geophysically underneath the Oceanic crust as well. So this gray rock here is Gabro. It's a feldspar bearing rock. It has some uh, olivine and peroxine in it. Um, and it contrasts with the rusty weathering rock down uh, below me here, which is peridotite. So this is a boundary between feldspar bearing rocks and rocks without feldspar. Probably formed in a magma chamber at a spreading ridge underneath a mid-ocean ridge. Um, and the earliest crystals to settle on the bottom of the magma chamber were mostly um, olivine and peroxine, and then they made peridotite. We call these rocks cumulate peridotites. And then later on, the rest of the magma crystallized to form this gabbro here. So this is one of the few places uh, in the world where you can actually stand on the moho, a surface which is usually buried between 5 and 70 kilo kilometers below the Earth's surface. Zooming into smaller scale structures, uh, we're going to be showing you some samples using the visual presenter, similar to the one that we have in the classroom. Uh, so I will switch over to that just now. And uh, you should be able to see here a granitoid rock, and it's been deformed. And you can tell that because as we move over to look at this surface here, you can see that there's a shiny silicon side surface with silicon lines on it giving you the direction of movement of a brittle fracture. So this is an example that's uh, been deformed in the brittle realm, probably relatively near the surface of the earth. Um, this black film uh, may even be melted material that was melted by uh, the frictional heating along that fault plane as it formed. Uh, that's certainly the case. Uh, if we look at this sample here, um, because this has a little, uh, what looks at first like an intrusion, um, but it's actually uh, molten material that's been generated during brittle fracturing. It's a material that we call pseudotacolite. Now I'd like to contrast this sample uh, with another granitoid here, uh, which doesn't actually look much like a granitoid because it has a very, very strong fabric. Uh, and you can see the domains of quartz and feldspar here uh, that are um, uh, stretched out uh, into very elongated uh, rods within the rock. And uh, this is a granitoid that was deformed much deeper down in the Earth's crust and it's behaved in a ductile way. And we will have a look at the processes that enable quartz and feldspar to be deformed by plate movements when they're deep in the crust uh, and how we can make inferences from those uh, structures about the processes uh, that deform the rock. We can actually go uh, one step further uh, down in scale. These are some thin section views of rocks very similar to the ones that I was showing on the, um, on the visual presenter. And uh, this uh, uh, one on the left is a real rock uh, showing quartz that's been strained. Um, you'll recognize maybe some of this undulose extinction or undulatory extinction if you've done optical mineralogy. And on the right-hand side, this looks like a quartz-bearing rock, uh, but actually is, this is polycarbonate. This is a plastic material, uh, but it behaves very much like uh, a rock being deformed at high temperature. And there you can see animated some of the processes that might have gone on to produce some of the kinds of structures that we see in uh, thin sections 
of deformed rocks. So I hope you'll consider taking EAS 421. Uh, the course is aimed at fourth year students in the geology program, but it's certainly accessible to third year students as well. You must have taken EAS 233 or an equivalent basic introduction to geologic structures. So hopefully we'll see you there and thank you for watching.